Before we begin today's episode, I'd like to make some quick shoutouts. Thank you, Alexandria the Demigod 167, Tai Azutara, and Legend of Portalcast. Thank you for your love and support for this show. It means a lot to us. I'd also like to apologize for my voice in this episode. If you remember in episode 4, Warriors of Kyoshi with Brianna Trujillo, Brianna came over to our house and got the whole house sick with the Selena Gomez virus. So in this episode, my voice is shot because of the Selena Gomez virus. So thank you, Selena Gomez. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Like, Selena Gomez would listen to this. But if Selena Gomez or anyone in her team that's listening to this, I'm joking. (laughs) But all jokes aside, without further ado... Warning. The following podcast contains massive spoilers. If you haven't seen Avatar The Last Airbender and Legend of Korra yet, and don't mind spoilers, hopefully this podcast will inspire you to watch along with us. Now let's begin. Hello, and welcome to Beyond Bending, a show about a bunch of millennials analyzing an animated kids show, Avatar, The Last Airbender. I'm your host, Marilyn Chantala, and today's special guest is... Hi, I'm Brian Sukram. And Brian is my friend. How long have we known each other? I want to say four years. It's been a good four years. Yeah. Yeah? No complaints. (laughs) So yeah, this is the infamous Brian that hates firebending. It's not hate as much as they're... They're cheaters, okay? Like, they're <laughs> cheaters. <laughs> I feel like I need to have you at least respond to <laughs> what Joanna said during episode one, part two, when oh, she no. totally called you out. Yeah, I actually did say something sitting in my chair at my home when Joanna said something, so <laughs> got a little heated. Is that when you texted me and you're like, Marilyn, I want to be on the show right now? Yeah, low-key, yeah. <laughs> Just through listening to it, I was just like, all right, it's time. Like, it's finally starting off, so I kind of want to give my input. Yeah, you reserved this episode pretty quickly. The episode we're going to be talking about today is Book One, Water, Episode Six, Imprisoned. So this episode is a very, uh, on top of it being very early on, it gives me a good opportunity to talk about how the firebenders are cheating because like it's so important to have the element that, that they are benders of to be a bender. Like the earthbenders were deemed useless because they were taken onto a ship where there was no earth for them to bend. Like, yeah. Firebenders are cheaters. <laughs> But yeah, Joanna had some very strong opinions Mm -hmm. about my comment when I said you thought firebenders were cheaters. Let's roll the clip. Please do. Well, okay. Like, I I like the little labor text that we get. Firebending comes from the breath, right? It flows through you. You build energy, and that energy extends outwards. And you mentioned this in in the introduction that you did. How Brian thinks the firebending is cheating because you just make nothing or you make something <laughs> so drastic out of thin air. I, I don't get that mentality because airbending is literally doing nothing. You know, like you, yeah. you can utilize airbending almost anywhere. I mean, probably not underwater, but you couldn't do that with firebending either, right? So there are limitations to firebending. But the fact that firebending and airbending both involve breath mm-hmm. is really cool and how that ties in together when you see how Aang kind of struggles with firebending in that way, right? Because firebending is creating the energy from within you and pushing it outwards versus manipulating the energy that's already from outside of your body, I think is cool. That contrast of how, again, when you place firebending and airbending like side by side, where they draw their energy from it's from a different place, but how they utilize it, I think, is very similar. So, firebending is not cheating. <laughs> it is legit. If you think firebending is cheating, then so is airbending. All right. Okay, only we have to talk about the episode, so... Yeah, no, I'll keep it short. Okay. Um, so, the reason that you compared firebending and airbending, we are surrounded by air. There's always gas in the air that is present, so... As an airbender, they're drawing from the air that is already present in the atmosphere. Earthbenders draw from any earth or rock or whatever is around them. Waterbenders need a source of water. For airbenders, their source is constantly around them. So they have that ability. They can bend whatever is already around them 
The firebenders, they said that, and I quote, the breath becomes energy in the body and the energy extends past your limbs and becomes fire. Uncle Iroh, episode one. To extend the energy past your limbs and become fire implies that there is fire within your body. You can't have fire, like you're, if you have fire in your body, you're going to like burn internally. So fire benders, like they're benders. All these guys are benders. They need a source to bend. So firebenders, to be able to punch a fist and fire comes out, there's no initial thing to bend. They're creating it out of nowhere. They need fire to manipulate in order to be a firebender. Okay, That's okay. Else I got. That's the main part. <laughs> All right. Maybe the next time I get Joanna on here, I'll <laughs> play this clip and see what she says. And just... it could be like a recurring thing. <laughs> there will be a debate episode coming up soon, and it's going to be crazy. I don't know. I'm mutual. I'm like Sweden right now. <laughs> I have an open mind. Okay. Well, better pick a side before the Fire Nation forces you to. Oh, shit. Sh- <laughs> okay. All right. Because they're cheaters. <laughs> yeah, there were a lot of moments in this episode, too, where I was like, holy shit, this is so unfair to everyone that's not a firebender. But we'll get into it. We'll get into it. All right, let's get started. The gang is camping out somewhere in the forest. Sokka is seen walking back to camp, and Aang greets him, excited for dinner. Sokka shows him the nuts he managed to find during his trip, but the gang isn't really that impressed. Momo tries to smash one of the nuts against a rock, but just as he does, the ground shakes. What was that, Sokka says. The ground shakes again. Aang and Katara run towards the sound, while Sokka says, Shouldn't we run away from huge booms, not towards them? As the gang peeks from behind a tree, they see in the distance a teenage boy practicing his earthbending. Aang wants to meet him, but Sokka thinks the earthbender is dangerous. But just as Sokka warns him, Katara is already shouting hello and introducing herself. The earthbender stops in place and runs away, covering his tracks with rocks in the process. Katara feels offended, because all she said was hello. Aang says that they should follow him because he's probably heading to the nearest village. Katara gets excited because this means that they don't have to eat nuts for dinner. Sokka's insulted by this, but then agrees that his nuts do suck. The gang finds the village and shop around the marketplace. Katara recognizes the earthbender and follows him into a shop. The mother inside the shop yells at the boy to do his chores, and it is in this moment where we find out his name. Haru! Katara confronts Haru and asks why he ran away from them. Haru denies this, but Aang backs Katara up and says that they saw him earthbending. Haru's mom freaks out and closes all the windows in the shop. She asks Haru what happened. Haru denies it again and says that the gang is crazy because, I quote, Look at how they're dressed. (laughs) Haru's mom warns him of the consequences that he already knows if they catch him earthbending. Right when she says this, the Fire Nation starts pounding on the door. A couple of Fire Nation soldiers enter the store and demand more money from Haru's mom. She says she already paid them, but the soldier threatens her by firebending a ball of fire between his hands. Fire is sometimes so hard to control, he says. Haru's mom gives in and gives the soldier more money. They leave. Sokka asks how long the Fire Nation's been in the village. Haru's mom tells him that it's been five years and that Fire Lord Ozai uses the town's coal mines to fuel the ships. Haru says that they're all thugs and that everyone in the town is too scared to do anything. Haru's mom silences him and tells him to not talk like that. Katara says Haru can help because he's an earthbender. Haru's mom says earthbending is forbidden and that he must never use it. Katara argues back and says earthbending is a gift and questions her, what can the firebenders do that they haven't done already? The mom replies back that they can take Haru away just like his father. (sighs) (laughs) So, starting off... How does the team run through all the resources so quickly? Like, didn't they just leave from Omashu? Like, they didn't have any, like, food or anything? Do you know Sokka? He, like, eats everything in his sight. And Aang burns rubber oh, yeah. seal <laughs> meat, oh, yeah. thinking it's fire. And then Momo and Appa, That's you gotta true. feed Appa. That's true. Okay, I'll allow that. <laughs> Quick point about the Fire Nation soldiers in this town. I feel like they are not the brightest group. Later on the episode, it will back me up on that. But um, what was it, like two episodes or an episode ago? The whole world knew that the Avatar was back because when he went into the Avatar state, all the shrines lit up. And so as well as when Zuko went to like get his ship fixed, that other general found out that the Avatar is back. So at this point, the Fire Nation should be aware 
And then, like, even Haru pointed out, all the clothes that they're wearing are weird because they don't look like they're from the Earth Kingdom. Clearly, Katara and Sokka look like they're from a water tribe because they're wearing blue. And Aang, I mean, even if it's been 100 years since they've seen the last airbender, like, it looks different, you know? These Fire Nation soldiers are not the brightest because, like, they got a good look at everybody acting natural. <laughs> and um, they didn't, I mean, if you see, like, other people, they'll be like, oh, what are you doing here, you know? I mean, it's a kid show, so I'll, I'll give it that. Yeah. I think they're drunk with power, though. That too. All they see is greed. Greed mm-hmm. blinds them. So when the soldier is talking about how, like, fire can, you know, spread and grow and basically was threatening to burn down the shop, this isn't necessarily them cheating, but it's more of, like, an unfair advantage with their elements. If you're earthbending or you're waterbending, you're using up your resource, you know, unless you're doing it right and you're able to reuse your resource consistently. If you shoot a rock at somebody and it breaks, you don't have as big a weapon as you previously had, like two seconds ago. Whereas firebending, if they light up a shop on fire, the fire's gonna grow. They're just getting more and more powerful, which would explain why they were able to rise to power so easily, other than the fact that they're cheating. That point is kind of just more an elemental advantage versus my strong hatred for those cheaters. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that. That's true. Although this episode made me think of if Earthbenders exploited their power as these Fire Nation soldiers, I think Earthbending would be way scarier. <laughs> Being crushed, I think, is worse than being burned. But it's a debate like, oh, what's worse to you, burning alive or drowning? Mm -hmm. For me, it's being crushed. Like, I think my greatest fear, either that or airbenders that would kidnap me and drop me 100 feet in the air because Mm -hmm. I'm afraid of heights and I would just lose my shit. Mm -hmm. Well, there's different ways that the benders can kill other people and stuff based on their powers. But take a water bender away from water, take an earth bender away from any rock, they're powerless now. Yeah. An air bender, you can't take an air bender, like, I guess you could put an air bender underwater, like you were saying. So then they can't really air bend, and same with a fire bender. But for the most part, an air bender is always going to have a source to bend. But a fire bender, no fire, what are we going to do? Yeah. But according to the show, no fire, no problem. They can just punch and make some fire. That's or true. Or breathe or whatever. They have unlimited yeah. resources. Exactly. Which is unfair. Yeah. That's pretty unfair. I'm, right? <laughs> Makes sense now, doesn't it? Yeah. That's pretty bad. Yeah. I want to talk about Katara's ignorance when she, one, meddles into family affairs. You should never do that. Like, it's never your place. You just met this guy and his mom. Mm-hmm. I know she has, like, a lot of passion and drive and, like, a lot of opinions about the Fire Nation. And mm-hmm. she just left home. She's kind of like a little college student <laughs> away from home and just goes crazy. I don't know. I could sympathize with her because she's finally able to be herself. And it's frustrating when she sees Haru, like, not being able to be himself. Mm-hmm. And then it's definitely, like, a callback to Egg's anger in the first episode, Mm -hmm. um, Boy in the Iceberg, when he doesn't understand why they're afraid of showing them where they live. Mm -hmm. And then with Katara here, she doesn't know the situation in this village. Mm -hmm. And so her big mouth (laughs) causes a lot of problems Mm -hmm. we see in this episode and a lot of consequences. And you see her make up for it. But at the same time, her buddy into this family drama is not a good, Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's not a good thing right now. Yeah. I feel like she kind of gets blinded by the fact that it's like he's a bender, but they want to kind of stop him from doing what he's able to do. She's so excited about being able to bend and like, other than Aang, this is, I think this is the first other bender that she's met that wasn't a Fire Nation or Boomy, I guess. Yeah, Boomy. Basically, she's kind of just like, he can bend. You know, why should he be scared to do that? Because she doesn't fully understand the situation. And you could tell like once she does, especially with the bomb, she kind of backs off, but then she kind of still like eggs him on, uh, which is wrong, but... Naive. They, that's yeah, the, that's all... probably because I mean they're they're kids and all that, so they're just kind of like still learning about other situations in the world, like where she grew up in you know in the South Pole. There was no like the Fire Nation had attacked, but they didn't have control over her tribe and her village. So they did live in fear of the Fire Nation coming back, but they didn't necessarily live in fear of the Fire Nation always being around, like how Haru has been living for the past five years in his family. Yeah. So that kind of naive in that sense, I guess. 
I, I think this is the first time outside of... No, it, I think it is. Like, besides Zuko's posse that, like, follow the yeah. gang around, this is the first time they've been exposed to... Like, what the Fire Nation is doing to the yeah. to the world. Like, like the presence of this foreign is, invaders. This is, like, her first time seeing, like, an oppressed village. She doesn't fully understand the severity of it and all that. And it's yeah. the first time we're seeing it, too. So, That's in true. a way, we, as viewers, we're looking at it through Katara's perspective. Perspective, mm -hmm. And we feel what she feels like. Why aren't you fighting back? And then yeah. we find out that they took all the earthbenders away mm -hmm. And that's why Haru is forbidden to earthbend. Earthbend's in hiding. But we saw him earthbend for the first time Or we see it's not the first time because yeah. we saw Boomy earthbend, but we see someone that's their age earthbending Yeah, oh. that's like a young and like growing earthbender yeah. And maybe that's why she kind of gets so excited because she's learning the wonders of waterbending and how like exciting it can be to learn all these different techniques. And she sees someone else who's kind of going through the same thing that she's going through. Like Aang is just already a master airbender. And so it's like she kind of just experiences someone else in her shoes who's still learning this whole wonderful world of bending and all that. Just cool. There's this quote that mm -hmm. still bugs me. And it's when Haru is denying everything and he mm -hmm. says, quote, look at how they're dressed. Mm -hmm. Like, whoa, microaggression, <laughs> if not macroaggression. <laughs> like if this show, there is so many nods to racism in this episode. If you take out the humor, mm -hmm. this episode is pretty dark. We'll get to it later, but you see the first one with Haru, like even though he's deflecting his view of outsiders and the mm -hmm. first thing he dismisses from them is like, oh, what they have to say doesn't count because mm -hmm. they're outsiders. And I'm just like, holy shit, dude, what's wrong with wearing blue <laughs> and like a monk uniform? I feel like I'm not going to like say, yeah, that's OK, but I feel like that's kind of coming from desperation to protect himself because of for the past five years of this guy's life, it's been living in hiding because of the Fire Nation taking over this village. For the past five years, he's had to just be like, I got to lay low. I can't deal with this because they'll take me away and then my mom will be by herself. And she has nobody to help her mm. and all that. Kind of like what you guys were talking about in the first episode with Sokka. How like he kind of got thrusted into being the adult or the man because all the others left the village. And he was literally the oldest guy in the village left. So he's kind of just being desperate to protect himself and basically not get taken away. Not have anybody know that he's an earthbender and all that. But yeah, that's very wrong. But on top of that, <laughs> saying look at how they're dressed. Why didn't the Fire Nation pick up on that? Yeah, they're, they're pretty dumb. Yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah, firebending as a form of bullying. That's, that's rough. It's not fair. They're cheaters. <laughs> they have an advantage to do as they please. They're using that power to kind of just take what they want, you know? They're bullying everyone because they can. It's like when you're in high school and you're the bigger, stronger guy, like you can bully the little kids because you can. They're just jerks. Oh, and then I hate it when the leader of that pack mm -hmm. was like, you can keep the copper ones, you oh, yeah. fucking peasant. <laughs> <laughs> like, wow. Drunk with power. Drunk with power. Mm -hmm. Didn't even see any of them. The avatar is right there in front of you. Yeah, doesn't care. Oh, what an idiot. Mm -hmm. Anyways, let's continue. <laughs> <laughs> So Haru walks the gang to his barn and says that they can crash there, but that they should leave in the morning. Aang thanks him and said he'll make sure Appa doesn't eat all the hay, while Appa is seen eating all the hay. <laughs> <laughs> and then continues to eat all the hay. <laughs> yeah. Katara apologizes to Haru about how she acted earlier, and Haru says it's okay. He tells Katara that what she said back at the shop reminded him a lot of his dad. He goes on and tells us how his dad was very brave, and that when the Fire Nation attacked, they were outnumbered 10 to 1, but fought anyways. They took his dad along with the other earthbenders, and no one's seen them since. Haru knows he shouldn't earthbend, but does it anyways because it makes him feel closer to his father. Katara tells Haru how she lost her mother in a Fire Nation raid, and that the necklace she wears is from her mother, and how it's the only thing she has left of her. It's not enough, is it? Haru says, and Katara replies back, no. Haru and Katara walk back to the village, but just as they are walking back, they hear a boom coming from the mines. They race towards the sound and see an old man trapped beneath the rubble. Katara pleads Haru to Earthbend to save the old man, and Haru reluctantly agrees. He launches the rocks into the mines and sets the old man free. The two help carry the old man back to the village. Later that night, Katara fills the gang in on what happened. Aang says she must have really inspired Haru to convince him to earthbend. Sokka tells him to get some sleep. 
Later that night, Haru gets taken by the firebenders because the old man ratted him out. Katara realizes this in the morning when she sees Haru's mom crying. She runs towards the barn and tells the gang how it's her fault Haru got taken away. Before the gang can react, Katara tells them that the firebenders are going to take her to Haru because they're going to arrest her for earthbending. The gang starts devising a plan. The plan is to use the ventilation shafts throughout the mines to make it seem like Katara is earthbending, but in reality, it's just Aang airbending through the shafts to lift up a rock. Sokka asks Aang if he's listening to any of this, and Aang says he's got it. Sokka doesn't believe him, but carries on anyways. The firebenders approach, and everyone takes their place. Sokka and Katara start fake fighting, and Katara pretends to earthbend. Nothing happens because Aang isn't paying attention. <laughs> Katara repeats her line again, and Aang finally hears it and starts airbending into the vent. The rock starts levitating, but the firebenders think it's Momo earthbending, not Katara. Sokka's like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> and tells them Katara is the one earthbending. The soldiers snap out of it and arrest Katara. That lemur, it's earthbending. So, I mean, I've already said it, the Fire Nation <laughs> taking over this town They're is so very dumb. <laughs> I, at what point can we stop saying, oh, it's a kid's show and just be like, yeah, these guys are stupid. But on top of that, once again, look at how they're dressed. Everybody in the Earth Nation wears forest green and yellow. To distinctify that they're from the Earth Nation, they see these two random people in blue. Yeah. Not that there's anything wrong to wear blue. But they see these two random people in blue arguing and they're like, yeah, she's an Earthbender. Definitely an Earthbender. Plus that fight with that fight air quote fight was just not really convincing like it's awful <laughs> yeah just like ang's like nonchalant attitude towards the whole thing he's not even paying attention to the plan any of that says we're taking the fun out of this we're about to get captured by the oppressing army Ugh. that is here and ang is just like yeah that's fun ang is i don't even know what to say he's just so arrogant mm -hmm. and annoying oh man but Again, it's like his defense mechanism to not take anything seriously mm -hmm. until he has to take things seriously. Yeah, which I can relate to because I do that personally as well. So <laughs> it sounds really bad because of my line of work. <laughs> For those of you that don't know, <laughs> Brian is a nurse, so he's pretty much seen everything. But like the gravity of their plan as well. Like I know they confidently have a way out, but like... Hold on, let me just go get captured by this army that wants to take over the world. Just whatever. Like, that is a terrible plan. It's a very extreme plan. <laughs> I don't think it's a very good idea. And Like, if you think about the big picture of the situation, let me just get captured. I don't know. I gotta respect Katara for immediately owning up to her mistake. That's a very grown-up thing to do. Like, in general, her owning up to this mistake. And we're in episode 6. Mm-hmm. We're barely, not even yeah, halfway in this so. season, and all of the character development, especially Katara and her owning up to things. Mm -hmm. If you look at any other character in any other TV show, mm -hmm. like, no one owns up to anything. Yeah, that's <laughs> so, true. So this further proves that Katara is amazing. Yeah, um, I mean, that is a good thing. It does show a lot of growth and all that because she immediately realized what she did wrong, how severe of a mistake that she made, and is planning to make equally as severe a risk to right her wrongs, essentially. That is a good like nod to Kadara, and she proves time and time again throughout the show that she is easily the most mature one on the team. It's good character development, which is always nice. I want to go back to when Haru and Katara are having like a heart-to-heart. Oh. -heart. oh my god. So good. Mm -hmm. Like what you said earlier, Katara finally found someone that is on the same boat as her in terms of like where they're starting out, learning bending, and a kid that's the same age as her too. Mm -hmm. I love how intimate they get. And like obviously you don't know if Haru is going to be a love interest or not. But I do love how close they bond with each other. Like this is the first person that Katara's met where she can relate to. Like with her mom being gone mm -hmm. and Haru's dad being gone. Like she has a friend. Like you know when you're pouring your heart and soul to a friend and they're listening. And all they can say is that sucks. Yeah. And like they can say I know but they don't really know. And when Katara is talking to Haru and Haru is talking to Katara, they can both say, I know, mm -hmm. and genuinely mean it. Yeah. And so it's just like, oh. 
Yeah. One of the easiest ways to connect with people is like, oh, we suffered similarly. We can understand how you feel and understand the pain that you've gone through. And it helps to relate because like, you know how hard it is to go through something like that. Oh man, can we talk about when they save that old man? <laughs> Haru's earthbending is so badass. Yeah. We see Boomy and what he can do, but mm -hmm. they were in a little arena that is meant for fighting. This is a mine, and he shoots like someone blowing a spitball, like shoop. Yeah. And he makes it look so mm -hmm. effortlessly, and he doesn't crush the old man. And yeah. so it's just this progression of you see him lifting up some boulders in mm -hmm. the beginning. But I love how the show is like a slow burn when it comes to showing the bending mm -hmm. and what people are capable of doing. And yeah. then later we see, once we get to the prison, like the full capabilities mm -hmm. of what Earthbenders have to offer. And it's so good. And also... Why did the old man rat him out? I just, I thought about it and I don't understand. I think it just shows how, just how much fear the Fire Nation has put into this town. Just because like, if they eventually found out that Haru is an earthbender and somehow they find out that that guy knew but didn't say anything or something like that, I feel like he's just trying to cover his ass. Or just trying to keep trouble out of the village any more than there already is. Because if they find out Haru is an earthbender, they might, you know, cause more trouble. Like, why were you hiding this guy? Everyone's tax has now gone up. Or we have all this power. We're just going to burn down this shop because we can. Because you guys didn't tell us that there was an earthbender here. I mean, you don't know. He might have a family and all that. But they don't, they don't show that. Which, it was a surprise. And it was kind of like, wow, really, dude? Like, he saved your life. And this is how you repay him. Because when I saw it, too, I was thinking, like, are they that afraid of the Fire Nation and what they are capable of? That's the only thing I could really think of. Other than that, it was just like, wow, you're, you're kind of a jerk. Come on, man. Yeah. You know? Snitches get stitches. Watch his son be the My Cabbages guy or something. Oh, <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Karma. <laughs> that was such a low blow. <laughs> I love that guy though. He's the best. It turns into the movie Holes, where, <laughs> where the Cabbage family is just cursed. <laughs> Dating back to before Aang disappeared, like a hundred years ago, yeah. and like someone did something. <laughs> it just caused just a hundred years of bad luck to the Cabbage family. Ah, uh, that'd be a funny small little short they could make. And then, just like the ending of Holes... <laughs> Like in Legend of Korra, he has like a multi-million billion dollar company <laughs> of cabbages. Oh, you haven't seen Korra? Oh yeah, we're gonna we're gonna mention Korra throughout this. Korra was okay. Podcast. I saw season one. I couldn't really get a hold of the rest of it, so I heard it like I heard it had like very progressive tones and everything. It was really good about that. Which is good. Like it's good that they're putting things like this into kids shows so that the next generation will be like, Oh yeah, this is normal. Yeah. That's nice. I have mixed feelings about Korra just because Avatar The Last Airbender is so perfect and so refined. Mm -hmm. Like from a filmmaker's perspective, Legend of Korra is not that great. I heard that a lot and that's kind of why I didn't really try to get into it. I saw the first season and I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. But then I kept hearing like kind of how like it doesn't live up to what Avatar The Last Airbender was. And I had so much love for Avatar The Last Airbender that I didn't want to kind of just wanted to leave it at that. So... Joe Anthony really likes Legend of Korra, and they were talking to me a little bit about it, and they kind of convinced me to give it another <laughs> shot. So maybe if when we finish all of Avatar The Last Airbender, maybe we could dive into Korra too. Because I do love all of the elements that they bring in mm -hmm. and their story building, but then I also hate as much as I love. So it's like a love and hate with me and Korra. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> Also, I definitely got like an X-Men vibe in this episode, especially with Haru suppressing his powers. Mm -hmm. And then it's never good <laughs> to mm -hmm. when you have powers to suppress it, mm -hmm. especially with an outside force, like the argument with nature versus nurture. When you're in a very bad environment that doesn't accept you for who you are and doesn't let you use your powers mm -hmm. and express yourself. It has a lot of negative consequences. Real quick, 
because when you brought up X-Men, my brother, whenever we talk about, because he's not like super into like the other Marvel movies, but loves X-Men because it's very like a really good analogy to the Holocaust in a sense, mm -hmm. because it is these people who are different, who have to hide who they are. And a lot of times we're being captured and like tested on and stuff like that. It does give that similar vibe because, you know, he gets caught as an earthbender and gets captured and becomes a slave for the fire nation it's just more like fear and constantly looking over your shoulder type thing that the fire nation is employed on this poor village or a couple villages in this earth nation i understand where you're going with the x-men vibe but now that you bring it up i do understand the similarities and stuff like that so it's it's a very good point to bring up <laughs> <laughs> You also see like respect and loyalty being established with Katara's relationship with Sokka and Aang because mm -hmm. they go with her plan. Coming from an older sibling point of view, mm -hmm. when your sister is like, I want to get captured mm -hmm. by Nazis, Basically. are you with me? I'm glad you said that because I've been wanting to say that this whole time that like they're essentially Nazis. <laughs> this is the Holocaust and Nazis and X-Men. Yes. <laughs> and okay, so the creators, I read that the creators were inspired by Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings. For Avatar? For Avatar, for, yeah. Okay. And so, um, I mean, I see it with the four elements and the four houses. Mm -hmm. Oh, before I forget, what bender are you? If I had to choose? If you had to choose. I guess... I guess water? I don't know. You haven't thought about this? <laughs> I, I actually have not. I feel like water just because the, the I'm basing it off of like, because I remember growing up, I looked into like each form of martial arts that it was based off of and water just was the most like interesting to me. But also because when I was growing up, I was in competitive swimming, so I was in water all the time. <laughs> so yeah, I guess water. Also because like the motions with it, fire bending seems very like angry. They did a very good job pairing the martial arts styles with each bending style. Because when you see people doing hungar, which is what earth bending is based off, it's very like sturdy. It's very stiff and like all of that. And water bending like is based off tai chi, which is like very flowing. So I feel like that's that resonates to me the most because I like that flowing movements and stuff plus like some of the stuff guitar does in the show throughout the entire show is just really crazy it's insane like to change the form of water from like liquid to ice just by breathing on it and stuff like that was crazy or just a lot of the other stuff that she did to fog she when she creates fog yeah oh man when we get there she heals people she's capable of so like water bending is capable of so much stuff <laughs> Bloodbender. Bloodbender. <laughs> That's why I want to be a waterbender. Yeah. I would be a waterbender too. Definitely. See? It's the best element. Because <laughs> firebenders are cheaters. Oh. So Katara is thrown on a ship, and the gang follows the ship from above to where they are holding the captives. Sokka reassures Aang that Katara knows what she's doing. The warden greets the new prisoners and starts monologuing. But one of the prisoners start involuntarily coughing, and the warden snaps and kicks a stream of fire at the prisoner. The prisoner jumps back in fear and dodges it, but the warden is not happy. He orders the soldier to lock him up in solitary. The warden tells the prisoners and Katara that the rig is made entirely of metal and that they're miles away from anything remotely related to Earth. Katara enters the prison yard, and Haru runs to hug her. Katara tells him it's her fault he got captured and that she's there to rescue him. Haru can't believe Katara got herself arrested and says she has guts. He introduces her to his father, Tyro. Tyro offers Katara some food, but one of the inmates interrupts by telling Tyro that the prisoners are complaining that there aren't enough blankets to go around. Tyro says he'll talk to the guards and see what he can do. Katara asks Tyro what their escape plan is, and Tyro is confused. He tells Katara that their plan is to survive, to wait out the war and hopefully get home and forget the war ever happened. This upsets Katara. Tyro explains that there are people's lives at stake and that the warden is a ruthless man. I'm sorry, but we're powerless, Tyro says. Katara won't stand for this. She stands on top of a bench and starts rallying up the earthbenders. She tells the earthbenders how she was told bedtime stories of how powerful and courageous the earth nation was and how even though the firebenders took away earth from them, they cannot take away their courage. Courage runs deep within them, and it is the strength in their hearts that make them who they are, and nothing can break that. She tells them the time to fight back is now. The Avatar has returned and yells out, Let us fight for our freedom! But the courtyard is silent. 
and the warden looks down from the tower and smirks as he sees Katara's speech fail. Poor Katara. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so first it shows how trusting Sokka is to reassure Aang, be like, oh yeah, she knows what she's doing, like going to the whole gravity of the situation again, like the whole big picture. Oh yeah, she's going to be fine. She got captured by the Fire Nation. They're going to keep her trapped on this ship, but don't worry. He has a lot of faith in his sister, which is, you know, it says a lot, which is good. Tyro just like kind of being the leader of the prisoners. That's crazy. Like it shows how great of a man he is that people come to him and be like, oh, you know, we don't have enough blankets. He's like, oh, I'll talk to the guards, like see what I can do. Like the fact that he has the courage to go talk to these guards who can just snap off on him at any point for no reason. And that he's just like, oh yeah, make sure all the elders are safe and the rest of us will just have to fight it out because he understands the gravity of his situation and he's just trying to keep everyone alive. He cares about each and every one of those prisoners on that ship and he wants to do what he can to make sure that they're okay, which is cool. When Katara gives her inspiring speech, you know, she talks about growing up in the South Pole. Once again, red flag, she's not from here. (laughs) How is she an earthbender if she's the warden should be like, maybe she's a waterbender, probably shouldn't keep her on a ship in the middle of the ocean. Not a great idea. That whole group. They're just stupid. They're not that bright. They're not. This is not a good representation of the Fire Nation right now. <laughs> this is not This is not a group of people that took over the world. I know at this point, the Fire Nation should know that the Avatar has returned, but also maybe not the best idea to be like, I know the Avatar has returned on a ship full of the Fire Nation, because I feel like the Fire Nation... As soon as they hear that, they know that the Avatar is the one thing that can stop them from maintaining control of the Earth. And that should kind of be like, oh crap, we should do something about this. You but know? even then, they don't do anything. I mean, it makes sense. And that's to show like they, they've lost hope because they've been through so much. At this point, they just want to survive, which is understandable. You know, They just want to go home yeah. at this point. Yeah, you don't see anyone going up to Katara later and being like, hey, did the Avatar really return? Like, they're so broken, no one cares. Mm -hmm. And like, I mean, you already know that word has been traveling. Yeah. So you you see in the last episode that the word traveled, like a word traveled quickly. They don't have phones and all that stuff, but you could see like how quickly the word went from the Earth Nation in Kyoshi to Zuko. So he was able to know that they were there. I feel like more people should be on the lookout for the Avatar at this point. And it shouldn't, like, surprise them that the Avatar has returned. But I guess because he was gone for a hundred years, the people who are alive now don't know what the Avatar is capable of, what the Avatar is able to bring. It's an entire generation who have only heard rumors and stories of the Avatar. Stories that have been passed down from their grandparents and all that. You know, Grand Grand would tell the story of the Avatar to Katara and Sokka. Nobody's seen an Avatar, nobody's seen an airbender in so long, so it's like... It's a myth. Yeah, exactly. Going back to what you said about Tyro being a natural born leader, like we get hints of it from Haru when he's Mm -hmm. talking about him, but you definitely see that even though Tyro is in a prison, it's his nature to lead, to Mm -hmm. take care of others, to be this role model even when like he's broken himself. Mm -hmm. And Katara relates to that. You see her in this episode, she's a natural born leader too. Mm -hmm. That (laughs) that speech (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's so great. It's so inspiring. And when she does see Tyro not having a game plan and just totally... Like defeated. Totally defeated. Mm-hmm. I think something in her snaps because when she looks at Tyro, Tyro's kind of a reflection of her, like an older version of her. Mm-hmm. And even though she's been through the war and she lost her mother, I think a part of her is scared when she looks at Tyro and sees that this could be her. And that's why she has the urge to get up and rally the earthbenders. Yeah. But then that fails. It's really heartbreaking when she does get defeated. Also, oh my god, George Takei. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And his, what is it, the warden's character. Like, such fragile masculinity. I don't even know how to describe it. He's just dick-sizing the whole time. Yeah, pretty much. He gets Um, offended when someone coughs. Yeah. 
once again, just I feel like it's just a drunk with power. Definitely just asserting the fact that they can't do anything and he's able to do whatever he wants. He can toy with these people all he wants. That power, he wants to flaunt it, basically. There's this line that George Takei says, or the warden, and he's doing his whole evil monologue <laughs> or whatever. And I quote, If you have any illusions about employing that brutish savagery that passes for bending among you people, forget them. <laughs> you people. <laughs> and it's ironic. I feel like firebending is... Brutish and savage. Yeah. I feel like that goes along with the character himself kind of being like, the Fire Nation is the best. That's the way he lives. To him, he's more powerful than these people. But in reality, it's just, you're more powerful than them because you took their bending away. Clearly, it's shown later in the episode when they do get their ability to bend that he's not more powerful for them. But like in his mind, his whole life, it's just an elitist type mindset where it's just fire bending's the best. Everything else sucks. Everything else not as pure. It's not as like kind of like that kind of mindset. Yeah, you know, the xenophobia is exactly. really strong with these firebenders. The xenophobia everywhere. Um, Haru, which probably is a result of the Avatar being gone. The nations became more divided yeah. because the one to bring them all together wasn't present. There was um, no Republic City yet. Exactly. <laughs> so, and the other thing is, all the nations are separated. Haru is what, we'll say he's what, Katara's age, so... 14? 14. So, I mean, he's gone his whole life not seeing anyone except Earth Kingdom people and Fire Nation Army. And to him, a 14-year-old, Earth Kingdom people are his family and Fire Nation is bad and scary. Then comes two people from the Water Tribe and an air nomad, like, whoa, this is different. They're crazy. And so, same with George Takei. We are the best and everyone else is inferior to us. That's the kind of mindset that the Fire Nation has. Yeah. I also want to talk about the rig itself. When we see the rig, it's in the middle of nowhere in the ocean. There's no earth at all. I feel like the Industrial Revolution happened with the Fire Nation. And you could say right now the Fire Nation are the Europeans that just want to conquer everything. And the Earth Nation is more like third world countries. Mm -hmm. And so they're taken to this rig that is completely out of their element. Not and really. the one thing that they found comfort in was all around them at home. It's like a completely different world to them. This mm -hmm. rig that's completely made out of metal. And it's just so heartbreaking. It's kind of like a shock to... You'd think that like it would be more shocking to some the people who are captured. Maybe it was at first, because when they first rounded up all the earthbenders. And even then, like for Haru, I feel like he was as calm as he was once he got to the ship because he saw his father and he was reunited with him. So I guess he found comfort in that. But for Katara, I guess it wasn't as intimidating because there was still water. So she's able to waterbend. But it is something crazy to just be picked up from your home and your village that you've known your whole life and thrown into somewhere else where you can't do anything. You're a prisoner and you're, you're just not allowed to be yourself anymore. A lot of oppression. A lot of oppression going on in the show. <laughs> in this episode, <laughs> they're basically Nazis. Yeah. What's it called? When they gather up, like, during the Holocaust and World War II with, mm -hmm. like, the Japanese Americans, they put them in... Where, like, in the U.S., because we were at war with Japan, any Japanese immigrants were taken and put in some place because they didn't feel safe around them. Like, that type of thing? Is that what you're trying to get at? Yeah. I'm wondering if George Takei chose this episode for a reason. Because I know he's a huge social justice advocate mm -hmm. for the Asian community, especially mm -hmm. for Japanese Americans. And he recently did a play about the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. Mm -hmm. I think the show is called Allegiance, or the play. And so... I could definitely see why this episode sparked his interest and he just like full on embraces yeah. the warden <laughs> and encompasses all of it. Good job, George the King. <laughs> <laughs> Later that night, Aang wakes up Katara and leads her to where Appa, Sokka, and Momo are waiting for her. Sokka tells Katara that her 12 hours are up and asks where Haru is. He tells Katara to hop in and that they need to leave now. Katara says no. She doesn't want to abandon these people, and that there must be some way to help them. Aang backs up Katara and asks Sokka if he'll join them. Sokka tries to convince Katara again to leave with them. Again, she says no. 
Sokka finally gives in and the gang hides from the prison guards. Aang whispers to Appa to fly away, and just as Appa is flying away, some guards spot him in the sky. The guards report back to the warden. The warden questions what they saw. One guard says it was a flying bison. The other guard says it was a flying buffalo. The warden asks which one is it, and a soldier replies back that it doesn't really matter. The warden gets mad and throws the soldier overboard. He tells the soldier to wake up the captain and to search the entire rig. The soldier tells him that the man he threw overboard was the captain. The warden tells him to wake up someone else. Meanwhile, the gang devises a plan on how to help the earthbenders escape. Sokka says that they need earth of some kind, something they can bend. Katara says the entire place is made of metal. Aang looks around and sees smoke coming from the chimneys. No, it's not. I bet they're burning coal, Aang says. In other words, earth. The gang draws up a plan similar to the one before. Aang will airbend the coal up the ventilation shafts and into the courtyard. Just as Sokka finishes explaining the plan, the firebenders surround Sokka and Katara. Tyro pleads with Katara and tells her she can't win. The warden tells Katara to listen to him because she's one mistake away from dying on the spot. Just as the firebenders move in on Katara, a huge pile of coal bursts through the ventilation shaft onto the floor. Aang and Momo fly from below and land on top of the coal. Katara climbs on top of the coal and yells at the earthbenders that this is their chance. The earthbenders start backing away. The warden laughs at Katara. He says their spirits were broken a long time ago and some coal and inspirational words won't fix them. Just as he is walking away, a piece of coal hits his head from afar. The warden turns around and sees Haru circling some pieces of coal in his hand. The warden firebends at him, but a wall of coal made by Tyro blocks the attack. All of the firebenders start firing away. The earthbenders unite and Tyro shouts out, For the Earth Kingdom, attack! <laughs> it's a full-on mutiny, fire versus earth. Sokka breaks some spears and throws it up. Momo catches them in the air. Haru earthbends with his dad and creates a compacted boulder that they blast towards the wall. The wall breaks. Tyro tells everyone to get to the ship. The warden tells the soldiers to not let anyone escape. Aang makes an air gun in the shape of a <laughs> mini tornado and tells the gang to load it up with ammo. They put coal into his tornado air gun and Aang shoots the coal at the firebenders and the warden and knocks them off of their feet. The earthbenders gather up the firebenders and the warden and lift them up over the rig. The warden begs for mercy and says he can't swim. Tyro says, don't worry, I hear cowards float and they fall into the water. We cut to Katara and the Earthbender sailing back home. Haru thanks Katara for saving them. Katara tries to wave it off by saying it just took a little coal. Haru says it wasn't the coal that did it. Katara blushes. Tyro comes over and thanks Katara for helping him find his courage. He tells Katara he's heading home to take back his village. To take back all of their villages! <laughs> <laughs> Haru tells her to come with him. Katara says she can't. Her mission is to get Aang to the North Pole. Haru thanks her again for saving him, and he wishes that there was some way he could return the favor. Katara says, I know, and instinctively touches her necklace, but realizes that it's gone! We see Zuko picking up Katara's necklace on the rig as he looks out into the sunset. Dun dun dun! So, once again, the warden's power trip clearly doesn't stop at other benders but it goes to his crew as well just he's kind of in this mindset of everyone's afraid of me i can do whatever i want also he threw the captain off the ship like how are they gonna he doesn't know who the captain is he does it yeah like all these things you're not a very good leader of this prison if you don't know your crew and all that stuff if they claim that they saw a flying bison buffalo whatever that may be and he says oh i don't like what's going on I'm suspicious of something a flying bison should be a sign of an airbender so once again they should be suspicious that the avatar is nearby Everything's lining up for them to be like, oh, the Avatar. And like, if it was, because imagine if it was Commander Zhao, he'd be like, the Avatar's here. Let's get him and then I'll get promoted and help secure the victory for the Fire Nation and all that. So this guy is not the brightest of the Fire Nation generals and whatnot. People can't see me, but I'm like, <laughs> I was cycling through, rolling my eyes, shaking my head and nodding my head. Yeah. If this is, you know, this village was the source of the coal source for the entire Fire Nation, with how many ships they have going around from nation to nation, you would think that the Fire Lord would be like, I need my best men here. This is a very important source to our empire. But nope, they're kind of stupid. <laughs> yeah. But holy shit, that prison riot. That's like the most action we've seen so far. Yes. Also, during that entire fight, 
Ang clearly airbends. <laughs> clearly. And this man's <laughs> first order is don't let them get off the ship when it should be. It's the Avatar. Get him. Like. <laughs> his ego, man. His. It's. Even if he doesn't do anything, he can take all the credit. Be like, yeah, my ship was the one that captured the Avatar. Yeah, his pride is as yeah. big as Appa. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I get it. Sokka's a really good fighter. But at this point, all the fighting that we've seen from him, mainly in the last episode, that's where we saw his talent develop, where he was able to train with the Kyoshi warrior. How is he able to take out and break the spears of four Fire Nation troops and just toss it up? Like, just bam, boom. It's flimsy. <laughs> These it's plot, flimsy wood? Plot armor. Plot armor? <laughs> plot armor. Well, the, the entire was, episode. The entire episode, the yeah. The entire episode No, I, I completely agree with that. I really thought that was dumb. I do like how Momo is catching yeah. the broken spears. Like, it gives Momo stuff to do. Because mm -hmm. I, I feel bad because when I watched it when I was in high school slash middle school, mm -hmm. Momo was always not even, not even a side character, but a background character. Mm -hmm. It doesn't help that he doesn't talk. Yeah. Like, there, he does have moments, but I never considered him, like, a supporting character until Tales of Bossy Say. Yeah. When you see his relationship with Appa. Yeah. And then same, ugh, I'm guilty of not appreciating Appa, too, mm -hmm. until he was missing. And then I was like, oh my god, yeah. this show's so good. Yeah. Up until this point, Momo has just been, like, cute factor. That was really it. That was, it was just kind of like an awe moment. Yeah. Anytime Momo was on screen. Like, it was really cute in the beginning of the episode when Momo's holding a rock and then he just hits it against another rock and then we think that he's the cause of the giant rumble. Every time Momo is on the screen, it's just like an aw. So I guess it was, yeah, it was cool that like they kind of gave him something. And even like when they first introduced him, it was just like a nice nostalgia thing for Aang to make him feel like even though he's been gone for a hundred years, some parts of his life are still normal. So like other than Appa... He has someone else that he can relate to and fly with. Yeah, this might just be me thinking it, but I feel like Momo is Aang's spirit animal. And you can argue that Appa is his spirit animal, mm -hmm. like his spirit companion. Yeah. It's his companion, but I feel like Momo reflects Aang's nature more than Appa because Appa and Aang are best friends. Yeah. They're soulmates, in, mm -hmm. a, in a sense, if you want to go that route. And you see more of this when you get to Tales of Boston and Say, and mm -hmm. you see Momo's relationship with Appa and how they're best friends. And you also see, like, in this episode, when Aang is, like, closing all the ventilation shafts mm -hmm. in the rig, Momo's, Momo's with, with him. him yeah. yeah, and he's always on Aang's shoulder. He's always flying with him. He's mm -hmm. just, like... Pikachu. He's like Aang's shadow. And there is that airbending element and the tie back to... The Air temple life. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think... <laughs> this is my theory. Momo is Aang's spirit um, animal. Yeah, it's a good point. But can we talk about Aang's tornado air gun? His tornado-shaped air gun. Soft gun? It's not soft. <laughs> no, it's not. It's the cold launcher. Um, it's... Yeah, let's call it the cold launcher. <laughs> It's cool because, like, it shows something new with airbending more than just pushing or making the ball so he could, like, move around. I feel like it's cool because it shows how well he has a grasp of airbending. Like, he is an airbending master and he's so in control of that element, which is constantly around him so he can bend whenever he pleases. Airbenders are not cheating, firebenders are cheating. <laughs> And then you also see how badass earthbending is. Because this is the most earthbending we've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And when earthbenders unite, it's powerful. Yeah. It's not scary. It's more like, I don't want to say inspiring. Because that whole word has been popping up throughout <laughs> the whole episode. It is moving when we do see these group of people that have been oppressed for so long mm -hmm. finally stand up against their oppressors and defeat them. And it feels so good. And it feels well earned because this has been a slow burn yeah. of just everyone's lives being ruined by Fire Nation. And while Aang is supposed to represent hope, he kind of doesn't in this episode. Mm -hmm. In this episode, Katara is the hope and we see Aang being the leader of the gang. But mm -hmm. in this episode, Katara is the leader and she owns this episode. Like, if Katara started a cult, I would join it. <laughs> like, Katara and the only other person I can think of is Kendrick. Like, 
I went to the TDE concert uh -huh. and it just so happens that it was on Mother's Day. And so it was just like a packed theater because everyone brought their moms. Yeah. And it was so amazing. It was the best concert I've ever been to. <laughs> I don't know. Random, random plug, I see. I'm sorry. I think Kendrick is God. Like, like after the concert, I was telling people, I was like, if Kendrick started a cult, I would follow it. Like, I kid you not, with disobeying logic, uh -huh. it's very bad. But like his charm mm -hmm. and his brilliant mind mm -hmm. and how he could just like rally a group of people. At the concert, everyone started chanting his name. Mm -hmm. And it was crazy. That feeling of being united is mm -hmm. so powerful like you could say like drunk with power yeah and you see how it just it just takes over the earthbenders and that gives them the strength to take over the firebenders and so you see the shift to power and it feels so good yeah and i feel like it feels better because you know they're fighting for good they're not like abusing their power like the firebenders are they just want to get home they just want to get to their families they just want to live peacefully whereas the firebenders are like oh we want to take over everything it's so much more satisfying because you know they're the good guys and you want the good guy to win in the end. Oh my god, the scene when Haru is finally earthbending with his dad. Yeah. And they compact the, the coal, coal yeah. into a huge cannon. Yeah. It's a, it's it's a cannonball. cannonball. Yeah, they made a cannonball. And they break a metal wall that's probably, what, 10 feet thick? That's insane. Yeah. It was a really cool moment, too, because, like, my dad's been taken away for five years. So, like, for five years, he hasn't seen his dad, he hasn't been with his dad, and he finally gets to bend with his dad. Like, that's a very bonding moment for them. I felt like you kind of got that when Haru shoots the first piece of coal and then the warden firebends and his dad protects him. You know, that was a very like, oh, wow moment. It's about to get real type thing. Even though you get so much feeling for these characters, and this was a half hour episode, but you get such an attachment to Haru because of how much he's been through. And then to see him finally be able to bend with his dad, that was such a like, just a feel good moment, as well as the whole, we're taking our religious back type thing. <laughs> I love Tyro. Rewatching this episode for this podcast, mm -hmm. I realize now that I fucking love Tyro so much. <laughs> he has so many great lines. Mm -hmm. Like, don't worry, I hear cowards float. <laughs> like, oh, uh, Mike, drop <laughs> and walk away. <laughs> Warden, drop. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is he a member of the White Lotus? I can't remember. I don't remember. I hope he is. I feel like they kind of have to bring him back. Yeah, because he's Cause so the voice amazing. Actor is so good. <laughs> Tyro too. I would follow his cult. He's so <laughs> he's so inspirational. He is. And his voice. What what's his name? Kevin Michael. Kevin Michael Richardson. Richardson. If you look at his filmography, yeah, it's he's insane. In everything. He's our childhood essentially. All the yeah. millennials. I also want to talk about like we go back to respect and trust. Mm -hmm and loyalty when it comes to Sokka, Aang, and Katara and how they go to the rig and they're like, okay, your 12 hours are up, yeah. let's go. And Katara's like, no, like I want to stay. I want to help these people. Mm -hmm. And Aang just immediately backs up Katara. Mm -hmm. And I love how Aang doesn't have that like very stereotypical hero trope of no, you can't get involved. You're the love of my life type of thing. I'm so annoyed with it in like every other part of superhero storylines like Peter yeah. Parker and Spider-Man he always mm -hmm. wants to protect Mary Jane but with Aang he knows that Katara is capable of handling herself mm -hmm. even against Nazis <laughs> 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 like he trusts her and he uh -huh. respects her enough to make her own choices he doesn't say anything and I also love how Sokka like he does want to protect Katara and he's like no you're crazy let's go but at the end of the day he respects respects and loves her enough to go with her plan mm -hmm. and to make sure that like he wants to see her return home safe and i think it's just so cute like mm -hmm. you see you see like the building blocks of their friendship in, and, but, in the sixth episode this yeah. is the sixth episode that's crazy listening to the first few episodes made me think more big picture when watching the show because you guys were like oh zuko thinks the avatar is this hundred year old man who has mastered all the elements and in his mind leading up to that battle he's gonna fight this amazing person and it finds out it's ang a 12 year old like it made me think about like other people's perspectives and like they realize that one the right thing to do their survival is the most important thing but if they can't save this one little village 
you know, how are they going to save anyone? You know, this is kind of pivotal to their mission of bringing peace. And this is one big way that they can bring peace. It is a really good showing of how much faith they have in each other and just how much they trust each other, I guess. Yeah. I love how, even though Aang is infatuated with Katara, mm-hmm. I don't want to say in love because mm-hmm. it's not love yet. Yeah. He sees Katara developing an intimate relationship with Haru mm-hmm. throughout this whole episode. It doesn't phase him. Yeah. And it could be like his ignorance and his naivety. He's mm-hmm. just like playing with, I don't know, he, he like keeps himself occupied. occupied he yeah. entertains himself. Yeah. And uh, maybe he doesn't see it. But mm-hmm. I do love how the screenwriters didn't write that in. Yeah, they that. didn't like try to make him jealous or anything. Yeah. Yeah, that definitely was good. I feel like if they did do that, it kind of would have... Taken away from Katara. This is essentially Katara's episode. Yeah. Also, kind of would have just put Aang in like a negative light and would have drawn more attention to their relationship this early in the series. That like clearly there's something, but it's kind of like small at the time, and it wouldn't be a good look this early into the show. Yeah, and I like how Katara can like you can be close to the opposite sex mm-hmm. and still be platonic friends. Yeah, and so I do like how they built Haru's relationship with Katara. Like mm-hmm. you don't know if he is gonna be love interest, mm-hmm. but you do know that they have a connection and intimacy. If I'm going to talk about the triangle of love, do you, do you know about the triangle of love? <laughs> in Avatar itself or just in general? No, I forgot what scientist thought it up, but his theory is that the ultimate form of love is consummate love. I think that's what it's called, mm-hmm. where there's a triangle and mm-hmm. at the points is intimacy, passion, and commitment. And you need to have all three to have the best form of love. You see it with Aang in the first episode. He's instantly infatuated with mm-hmm. Katara. So, like, there's that form of passion. Mm-hmm. But then, like, you see Katara and Aang, like, bonding. And so there's that intimacy. Mm-hmm. And so commitment isn't shown until, like, the last episode, mm-hmm. essentially. Yeah. But, yeah, I do love how intimate Katara gets with Haru. It's not just about, like, partners. Like, mm-hmm. you have intimacy with friends. Mm-hmm. Like, with best friends, that love triangle is, is intimacy and mm-hmm. commitment. That was well put. <laughs> <laughs> I get that. It's just, like, good to see two people connecting without, like, going overboard with it, I guess. But yeah, um, any final thoughts on this episode? Let's list out all the things we learned in this episode. <laughs> we met the bad side of firebenders. Like, the worst side of firebenders that mm-hmm. are really stupid and really arrogant mm-hmm. and bullies. Yeah. Katara's a badass. Mm-hmm. That should start a cult. <laughs> Aang didn't cock block, and that was a good thing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> George Takei <laughs> <laughs> and Momo can earthbend. <laughs> this episode, I don't know if it's just me loving the show and all of the huge fans, like after the show ended, just started like making all these memes and these clips of so many good quotes from the show. Uh-huh. But this episode, I feel, had a lot of great quotes. This episode was just very, like, it had a lot of weight to it. There's a lot of symbolism in it. Yeah. For the people who do stuff like this, like, look back at their shows of their childhood and stuff. We could see how big a deal these episodes are, how much they were trying to teach us. And looking back on it now, we're still learning. The show ended 10 years ago, and we're still learning from it. Like, that's insane. This is a really, this podcast is a good idea. I like this. (laughs) (laughs) I'll be back. You'll be be back. back. I'll find another episode that I can (laughs) heavily debate the cheaters of the show easily. I'll set up a debate episode and bring everyone (laughs) in. It'll be a full on. It'll be a yelling fest. (laughs) (laughs) No. We'll try to be civil about it. I'll I'll be civil. Like, that's the thing. It's cool that we can have a very civil and adult conversation about a kid's show. Yeah. Because we're a bunch of millennials. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) We're mid twenties. Yeah. I'm I'm twenty six. You're I'm twenty six. You're twenty six. Yeah. It feels old to me, but when I say I'm in my mid twenties, I feel young again. <laughs> Especially when talking about a kids show. Yeah. So. <laughs> it's nice. Do you have any plugins for our listeners? Instagram and Twitter. I'm at Brown Ted Bear. Follow me. Follow my Twitter. You'll you could read up on my initial rant about this <laughs> way back when. <laughs> and I'll I'll put it in the description below for our listeners too. 
But yeah, follow Beyond Bending at all of the social media. Just Google Beyond Bending Podcast. I'm your host, Marilyn Chantala. And yeah, if you if you guys like what we're doing so far, let us know. <laughs> I know our followers on our Facebook page and Instagram and Twitter look lame right now, but <laughs> we're just starting. So help us out. Tell your friend. Yeah. <laughs> be like Haru and be the first one to start it. And then a bunch of people will flood in and <laughs> and it'll be awesome. And so, yeah. Um, thank you guys for listening. Thank you, Brian, for being here. And Pleasure. Okay, honestly, I haven't even recorded episodes two through five yet. <laughs> this is how advanced Brian hit me up. I was ready. Yeah. <laughs> I was ready. <laughs> but yeah, thank you for being on. And as they say in the Avatar universe... Flame me on, Hotsman. <laughs> what's what's your catchphrase? My cabbages. Are you kidding? No way. It has to be my cabbages. Flame me on, Hotsman. Nah, my cabbages. All right. We should everyone, all the listeners, convince her to make my cabbages the uh, closing statement. <laughs> when you're flying in the sky on a bison way up high with your friends. On a journey across the sea, we'll be soaring peacefully, drinking cactus juice all day till we hallucinate.